last time I said that science is as a magic trick. Magic trick is not easy to understand. Even very smart people are baffled by trick, but once they know the secret, everything makes sense. And then they say to themselves, how come we didn't see that? It is so obvious. How magician fools people? He drives their attention from the important thing to not important thing. That's it. He hides the truth by acting, pretending that he is revealing to you everything. And so someone who knows the trick can tell you where you should put your attention, but it is up to you if you will listen to him or not. If you like the trick, you will not want to hear the truth. If you want to be lied, that is your choice. And you will never ever know the truth if you think that you are smart, which is strange because you don't understand how the trick works, because it shouldn't work but you have faith in magician and in yourself. You refuse to listen to anyone who has to say something about mistakes or the seeds of magician. And even if you hear how some trick really works, you might be more than prepared to justify that trick, deceit, a magician's lie. And if you are a magician apprentice, well, you will find out the truth, but by hiding it and by cheating people, you will live just nicely. So it is up to you. Do you love the truth or not? And if you don't love the truth, the reality, you have chosen yourself a lie and you will be cheated. It is as simple as that. Magician lies to you usually from the beginning. It seems that he explains to you everything. Everything makes a complete sense. But at the end, you are baffled. The thing doesn't make sense. So let's begin with tricks of Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei is considered to be the father of modern astronomy, of modern science. He is known to be the first martyr of science. It is believed that Roman Catholic Inquisition persecuted him because of his scientific worldview. In the minds of almost every one of us, it was implanted a story, how after his trial he sat quietly, but nevertheless it moves. The earth namely. So he is considered to be a giant, a giant of science who has disproved the Bible. We were taught that by teachers and by scientists and media and even by priests. But is that true? Let's start with Inquisition. Roman Catholic Inquisition tortured people in the most horrible ways. Catholics killed many who didn't agree with them. Many people were burned. If you were a believer in Christ Jesus who said to Christians, that they should call no one on the earth their father, because one is their father who is in heavens, and you refused to call Bishop of Rome, Holy Father, Pope, you were in danger. They tortured you and killed you. You were martyr of Christ. Some people were martyrs of their own faith and hate. They just hated Catholics, and since Catholics were more powerful, they easily killed them. And some people were martyrs of witchcraft and of beauty. If you were a beautiful woman who didn't want to have sex with some Catholic, even priest, you could easily be tortured and burned as a witch. Those were martyrs. Those people were persecuted. And so terrible was persecution. And what was the case with martyr Galileo? Well, his colleagues were Jesuits who loved science and who were promoting it. He was not persecuted until he mocked the Pope and verbally attacked one Jesuit. And then he was trialed. And what was his sentence? Was he tortured, burned? No. He spent his last nine years in a house arrest, where he died at the age of almost 78 years. He even kept his property and he even continued with his scientific work. During his house arrest, he wrote, according to some, one of his finest works, Two New Sciences. And now the question for you. Are believers in science who claim to be trustworthy really telling us the truth when they claim that Galileo was a martyr? He is considered to be the father of modern science, the beginning foundation. And if scientists are lying about their foundations, about those things we understand, how can you trust them about anything else what we cannot understand? And now let's continue with his claim that Earth moves around the Sun. Only a couple of ancient Greek philosophers claimed such a thing, and it was not until Copernicus that this idea was revived and made popular by Galileo. Before Galileo, people claimed that Earth is in the center of the universe, 
what is known as geocentric view. Geos means Earth. And after Galileo, it became a popular idea that the Sun is in the center of the universe, what is known as heliocentric view. Helios means Sun. This view was later corrected or changed. The Sun is only near the center of this particular solar system and it is moving. So what is the truth? Did he know or did he not know? Did he disprove geocentric system or not? Well, I have just told you. Heliocentric view of universe was rejected by later scientists. So Galileo was wrong. But was he close enough or completely wrong? You see, science is describing the world. And you can describe a street if you are on one side of the street or on the other side, or even if you are driving a car. No matter where you are, you are describing the same world from your viewpoint. If you are on one side, cars are moving to the left. And if you are on the other side, the same cars are moving to the right. Only a simple geometrical transformation is needed, reflection in this case, to transform one view to another. We do that in our minds or using geometry or equations. And that's what science does. Almost all astronomical observations till the last century or so were made from the Earth, from the viewpoint of the Earth. All those observations were made in a coordinate system where Earth is not moving, but the universe is moving around it. Calculations were performed in heliocentric system, but all those calculations had to be transformed into geocentric system, so that scientists were and are able to observe them. So if you think that geocentric view was done away with Galileo Galilei, you are wrong. Practically all our observations of stars are done from the Earth using geocentric system. Physicists are using many different systems and they swap between them as they like. One makes calculation in one system because it is easier, but to predict what will be observed, he usually has to transform that system into his viewpoint. Physics is the same in both systems. It is only a matter of convenience. So did Galileo disprove geocentric system? No, it is still in use, maybe under another name, but it is still in use. Galileo found only a fault with an existing geocentric system at that time, which was made by Roman astronomer Ptolemy. You see, there is not a question which system is right, geocentric system or heliocentric, because astronomers use both of them. The question is, if a particular geocentric or a particular heliocentric system is right or not. One can make even heliocentric system wrong. If one makes up a system where location of Mars and Venus are swapped, that system will not fit the reality. It will be false and it doesn't matter if it is heliocentric or geocentric. And now the trick of Galileo or his proponents. Galileo showed that Ptolemy model was wrong. He observed that Venus exhibits full sets of phases similar as Moon does, implying that Venus is orbiting around the Sun. He disproved Ptolemaic geocentric system, and that's all. But today it is being claimed that he disproved geocentric system. Well, that is false. He didn't disprove the right geocentric system, which existed in his time, system of Tycho Brahe, which is simply ignored. People are not told about his system. So did Galileo disprove geocentric system? No, geocentric system is still being used by scientists. He disproved only one very bad geocentric system, but the one which was as good as Copernicus, he didn't disprove. That system was only ignored. The point is that if you don't know the forces, and Galileo Galilei didn't know them, there is no way to say anything about which body is moving and which not. If he would say that he has a theory, that's fine, that's scientific, but if he claimed that he knew, when in fact he was only speculating, didn't have any proof, well, that goes above ignorance of just judgment, that goes above ignorance of scientific methods. That is a serious deceit, maybe even self-deceit. There is not a lot known about Galileo's arguments and that raises another doubt. What I was able to find was that he tried to explain tides as a result of rotation of the Earth around its axis and orbiting around the Sun. 
Science is teaching today that tides are a result of the gravity of the moon. His argument was completely wrong one. What else did he do? Before Galileo, people believed Aristotle, who claimed that heavier objects fall faster than the lighter ones. Galileo claimed that no matter what is the weight, the objects fall with the same speed if they are in vacuum. This claim is being attributed to Galileo, even though others claimed the same thing before Galileo. He also rejected Aristotelian hypothesis that objects naturally slow down and stop if no force is applied to them. He formulated the following principle. A body moving on a level surface will continue in the same direction at constant speed unless disturbed. This principle, which was in a similar way proposed by many people living centuries before Galilei, was incorporated into the first Newton law of motion. As far as I have heard, he invented the telescope, but that is not true. He copied the invention of Hans Lippershey and sold it as his own invention. He was egocentric. He was me, me, I, I generation. He argued that he was the first who had observed the sunspots. He disputed with the Jesuit Christoph Scheiner, who also claimed to be the first who observed sunspots. It could be that it was because of this dispute that he lost some favor in the eyes of Roman Catholic Church. Was he the first? Most likely not. Kepler observed it first, but mistook it for the transient of Mercury. But according to Wikipedia, it is a little doubt that before Galileo and Jesuit Scheiner, those sunspots were observed by David Fabricius and his son Johannes. Galileo's life was full of lies, fighting with others, stealing ideas from others and selling them as if they were his own. He discovered a couple of things by himself that could be true, but not everything what was accredited to him was really his or exclusively his achievement. He was proud and that led him toward persecution. Because of his pride, he was prepared to put at risk even his life and life of his family. He was right in his own eyes, even though he was proven wrong by today's science. According to his character, it is not a wonder that the Catholic Church had regretted what she had done to him because they are similar. And from the year 1939 on, Catholic popes are speaking good things about him and about his theories and his contribution to science. And let's continue toward Isaac Newton. Another giant to be mentioned before Newton was Kepler, who lived in the time of Galileo and he did some astronomical observations too. He used his own ones and the ones of deceased Tycho Brahe and fit the observed data with mathematical formulas or descriptions. Those descriptions are known today as Kepler's laws. How he got them? By epiphany? He just got an idea. From someone or somewhere and that idea those equations fit data good enough. And by the way, those findings were ignored by Galileo Galilei and other major scientists at that time. But Isaac Newton used them and incorporated them into his theory. Newton's theory was simple and it gave very good results for experiments here on the Earth and his equations and assumptions described very good also what is going on in our solar system or earthly system. People gained much power using Newtonian mechanics. They were able to make new machines, weapons. They were able to kill more people, to destroy, pollute more soil, water. And they were able to predict path of celestial bodies as comets, for example. Those were the proofs which confirmed Newton's mechanics and his theory. And because of that, his theory was proclaimed a law. In science, there exist at least two fundamental questions which prevent any scientist to claim that his theory is the right one, the real law. This is not told to people and even scientists themselves don't speak about that. It is covered up, ignored. Philosophers of science and some scientists who actually think they know about those things. The first question, how to know which theory is right? And the second one, if something is true on a small scale, is it true also on a larger scale? Newtonian mechanics was accepted as the truth because it was simpler than other theories were and because it predicted many more things here on Earth 
than other theories were able to predict, and those predictions were confirmed by observations, experiments. So, there are two criteria scientists in theory follow when they decide which theory is better, more right, than the other one is. The criterion of simplicity. The simpler the theory, the better, and the criterion how many phenomena a theory describes and how good are those descriptions, predictions. Many times in history of science it was shown that scientists, because of their own ego and selfish reasons, didn't follow those rules, they were not objective, their judgment was not just, that's why I said that in the theory scientists follow those criteria. But even if someone would follow those criteria, will he come to the truth always or can it happen that he will proclaim a lie for the truth and the truth for a lie? It can happen in our daily life and in science too. You might be persecuted by a court that you have killed one person, Mr. X, and took his money. That money would be found at your house. A person, Mr. L, who is known for being very just and who is a very respectable member of community. By the way, you are not. Mr. L would testify that he saw you how you killed Mr. X. Mr. L saw you at that time for the first time. Your best friend would testify that he saw how you planned and were preparing yourself to do that crime. And so on and so forth. So what would the judgment be? The simpler theory is that you have killed that person. The more complex theory is that all those people are deliberately lying or that they had wrongly seen. Their measurements, observations were not right. You know that their theory is wrong. The only thing is that you cannot come up with any reasonable explanation, any reasonable theory, why are they wrong. Their theory is simple, they have proofs. Your theory is complex, if you have one, and you have no proof. Their theory makes sense, your doesn't. And judgment of scientists was like that. But to be able to see the truth, you have to be very open-minded and not narrow-minded. You would have to know things which were hidden. When a white trash, that is a human being, as it is called by many self-proclaimed philanthropists, when a white trash accused of a murder would start to explain hidden things, he would be laughed at. And if he could back up his claims, the more he would speak, the more sense all the things would have and the less sense the testimonies of Mr. L and all the others would have. And if that means that very prominent members of society are thieves and murderers and liars, the judge, the chief of police and so on, well, it is so. It happened in real life, and not only once, and not only to one person. And such was the case with the geocentric and stationary Earth theory and the heliocentric or moving Earth theory. People believed Newton. And another assumption, which is many times used in science, is if something is true on a small scale, it is true also on a large scale, especially if you don't see any reason why that should not be so. Is that always true? Not necessarily. You see a little baby and a grown-up. And you can imagine great giants who are as big as mountains in your imagination. But do such giants exist? Only in the occult, in superstitious fairy tales of ancient mythologies in imagination. In the real world, they don't exist. But one can still imagine giants who are 100 meters tall. If you don't understand the forces, gravity and so on, if you don't understand why such giants cannot exist, then you see no reason why they shouldn't exist. In the Bible there are mentioned giants too, but those giants were less than 10 meters high. They were 3-4 meters high and that is possible. Let me give you another example. If you would give a magician or a businessman a dollar, he might make another one out of it. And you would give him two, and he might make additional two out of them. And now the question. If you would give him ten millions, will he make additional ten millions or not? You might not want to see any reason why that would not be possible. But I can see many reasons why it could happen that you would never again see that magician, businessman, nor your money. 
he might give you some proof in this particular case too. He could give you 10,000 bucks at once and then 5,000 bucks. And that would strengthen your faith in him. But for the rest of the money, you would have to wait. And man, would you wait and wait. If you put your trust in proofs on a small scale, you might be left with nothing on a large scale. And so it was with Newton. We can test his mechanics and it works on a small scale. And he assumed that it works also on a large scale. Why not? He didn't want to see any reason against. We can look at rotating ball and measure forces on it and we can imagine that that is true also on a larger scale, on a larger ball, such as Earth is. Why not? It is so easy to imagine that Earth is rotating, especially because his theory predicted how celestial bodies move. But was his theory correct? No. Because stars were observed which do not move according to the Earth as they should according to Newton. All those proofs of a rotating Earth are based on our imagination. Before Newton, scientists imagined that gravity is a constant force, not dependent on distance. Newton changed that, but he kept the notion that forces are independent on location. But no one can know that. Foucault made a pendulum, which apparently proved more than 100 years after Newton that the Earth is rotating, and gyroscopes were invented, which also prove that the Earth is moving. Or do they not? It was claimed that those things can be explained only if the Earth is rotating. And that, of course, is not true. Physicists can describe motion of gyroscope and gyrocompass also from the viewpoint of the non-moving Earth. Forces, which are known also as Coriolis forces, are causing the gyroscope not to change its direction relative to the stars and so on. In small experiments and in our imagination, those forces are fictitious. But if we don't know the nature of forces, can we say anything about how forces work on a larger scale? Are Coriolis forces observed on a larger scale on the Earth result of rotating Earth or are they result of rotating Universe? We cannot tell. If you decide that the Earth is moving, then you can describe those experiments correctly. But if you decide that the Earth is at still, you can describe those experiments in the same way. It is a matter of choice. So, were the proponents of science telling us the truth or were they wrong or hiding something from us when they were telling people that they have proofs that the Earth is moving? They were deceiving themselves and others too. Stellar parallax was observed in that time too and that was considered additional proof for the moving Earth. But then stellar aberration was discovered. Stars didn't move as they should move according to Newton's theory. And it was confirmed. Newton's theory works on a small scale, but on the large, not. No one had the answer at that time, until Albert Einstein came with his theory of relativity, which is a transformation of Newton's viewpoint into another one. Similar as Copernicus and Galileo and Newton transformed the view on the world from geocentric to heliocentric view, so did Einstein do with their equations. This was another transformation. Actually, this transformation was already done by Lorentz, and it is known as Lorentz transformation. Einstein took it and applied it. Another Earth-moving, or should I say Earth-stopping experiments were done in that time. All scientists were shocked and baffled. The peak experiment of the age was the Michelson experiment. And here science went completely against itself. Scientists have completely abandoned reason at that time. Till that time, it was reasonable to assume that energy or waves travel through some kind of medium. Water waves travel through water. Sound waves or sound travels through air. Waves on a string travel through string and so on. And what about light? It was a scientific and logical and reasonable hypothesis that light travels too through some kind of medium. What was that medium? Scientists didn't know what it was, so they called it ether. It seemed that light could travel also through chambers without air, through almost vacuum. There were and are a couple of ideas what ether was and is. It is basically a space in which we live 
or it is like a matrix, something like computer screen. Computer screen might seem to be black, but one dot is moving from one place to another. And one could explain reality in this way too. Atoms are a perturbation in this matrix. If you cannot see black dots on the computer screen, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And this reasonable construct, ether, was in use in science all until Einstein, who rejected it completely. Why? Mainly because of Michelson experiment. What was all about? When a police car with a turned on siren is moving toward you, you hear higher pitch, and when it is moving away from you, you hear lower pitch of the siren as when it is not moving. Why so? Because it moves relatively to the medium, the air, and its speed changes. And in case that you, as an observer, move relatively toward the medium, the air, you will hear different pitch of the siren too. Why is that so? Because change in pitch is dependent upon the relative velocity. And so, scientists wanted to measure the same phenomenon which was observed in water waves, sound waves, also in light. But for such an observation, they needed to attain high speeds. And since at that time, the idea about the moving Earth was already accepted as a fact, the Earth itself was the fastest moving object that they could use when doing such experiments. If ether is stationary and the Earth is moving relatively to the Sun and the ether with a speed of 30 km per second or 108,000 km per hour, they should be able to detect the change in speed of light in different directions here on the Earth. But they didn't observe any change in speed. Logical and reasonable conclusion would be that the Earth is not moving. But they refused even to think about that possibility, so they came up with another idea. Maybe the Earth is dragging behind itself to some extent ether. Couple of decades passed and by newer, more precise measurements it was shown that this cannot be. So, what did scientists try to do then? They were searching for the most simple equation, transformation, which could transform Newtonian mechanics and fit observed data. And Lorentz found such transformation and Einstein used it. There exists countless possible transformations which could give the same observed results. Theory of relativity uses only one, which works good enough, that's all. How Lorentz got those equations? With blind guessing. I'm not claiming that the speed of light is not constant here on the Earth. But even if the Earth is stationary, that doesn't mean that speed of light is not constant in a given space and time, or almost a constant. So Newton was wrong, velocities don't sum up. If you are traveling with the 0.9 speed of light and you turn on a lamp, the observer, which is in front of you, will measure that the beam of light is traveling with the speed of light and not with 1.9 speed of light. And reasonable conclusion is that the speed of light is the ultimate limit one can attain. No one can accelerate until infinity. So what happens? Acceleration has to change. If you are accelerating with the force F and your mass is M, your acceleration has to drop. How is that possible? If your mass increases. If you would travel with the speed of light, your mass would be infinite, according to Lorentz and Einstein. And spatial coordinates also have to change shrink and time has to change too. And such transformation was done by the theory of relativity. If you suppose that the Earth is moving, there is no ether, or there is no need to refer to ether anymore. And so Einstein removed it completely. At least so it seemed. And here is his trick revealed. He removed ether, but at the same time he was explaining things using ether. How corrupt is that? Very corrupt. For example, gravity bends space or space-time, and the example of a ball on a couch is given. Well, if space is nothingness, it cannot be bent, it cannot be deformed. This was my argument against Einstein's magic, but a couple of months ago I found out that Tesla had the same argument against Einstein's theory. If you have yellow color, you can make a painting which is in one area more yellow, 
and in another area less yellow. You can deform yellowness, but you cannot deform nothingness. So why was Einstein propagating such an obvious stupidity and why no one cares? It is not that I was the first who noticed that. Tesla said it. Why was Tesla ignored? There are many reasons. One is the following one. Who is regarded as very intelligent person? Einstein. And that is the reason why people don't want to say that he was wrong. They don't understand his theory, elimination of ether, because it is wrong, it is stupid, it is a lie, and everyone can see that. But if they would say that his theory is stupid, they would be regarded as stupid. It is the same principle as in the story of the emperor's new clothes. So Einstein eliminated very lightly the only reasonable explanation how come the speed of light is the limit. The faster you travel, the more resistance will be produced by ether. It is not that your mass is increased. And some scientists today don't want to use the phrase relativistic mass because relativistic mass is not really a mass. It is deceiving people. They say that mass or energy is put into space-time. Well, why don't name that ether? Science always claimed that it is all about causes and reason. Well, here cause and reason were completely removed. Speed of light is constant and the limit because it is so. There is no reason. Well, who is controlling that no one exceeds the speed of light? No one. There is no reason, no cause in the viewpoint of theory of relativity. And with ether, one can understand why particles, when traveling with high speed, decay slower than those which are at rest. The nucleus is held stronger together, that's why. It is not that time changes. Oh, but that is the thing which makes his theory attractive. We could build time machines and bend space-time and travel through universe. Yes, we could bend nothingness. That's a fairy tale, but people like it. That brings in them faith that we could cheat death one day. That we could become gods, immortals, without coming to Christ Jesus. So how does time change? Imagine that you were European, living in 1900s, and you would travel to United States. Each day you would write a letter to your family. And let's say that postmen would travel with the same speed as you were traveling. So at the end of the first day, let's say March the 1st, you would write a letter. Postmen would need one day to deliver it to your family. Your family would open it on March the 2nd, but they would read that your date was March the 1st. And on March the 2nd, you would write them another letter, and they would get it on March the 4th. For you it passed two days, but for them four days. What would be their conclusion? If they would make scientific, logical, reasonable conclusion, they would say that if one moves, his time slows down. And what would your comment be? It's stupid, isn't it? And why then you believe someone who is telling you actually the same thing, but his name is Albert Einstein? And another reason why theory of relativity without ether, without one special coordinate system, is a lying and stupid theory. People like to hear this fairy tale all the time. Imagine. Well, all fairy tales start like this. So imagine that you are on a rocket which goes toward one of the nearest stars, which is 40 light years away. You are traveling almost with the speed of light, and when you would come back, all people you knew would be dead already, because here on the Earth it would pass more than eight years, but you would be older only a couple of months. Is that possible? Well, imagine that there are only two persons, two objects in the whole space. The one which is moving faster, his time will run slower, and the one which is at still, his time will run faster. And now the question, which clock will run faster? This problem cannot be solved, because they both might be moving, or only one of them might move. Which one? No one can know. Why not? Because there is no ether, no special coordinate system, no stars, no space. But as soon as you bring in ether, special coordinate system, earth and stars, you can determine 
which clock is running faster. I hope you understand now the trick and the lie of Einstein. And please notice that all those quasi-experiments performed on small scale with atoms and atomic clocks flying on the planes with small differences in time, milli or even microseconds or less. You are making a huge mistake if you extrapolate those results on a large scale without really knowing the mechanisms which govern those processes. I am not saying that time is not relative. Bible speaks about relative time. I am telling you only that you should not imagine something to be true which is not possible for you, not even according to today's science. And I am saying that time might be relative in another sense, as theory of relativity claims that it is. And here another deceit was done. Newton attacked by his assumptions, or Galileo's assumptions, the authority of the Bible. The Bible speaks about different foundations. Newton said basically, the laws are everywhere the same and they are such as I have wrote them. Well, that is a partial truth. In Russia you have similar laws as in Germany or United States or China or India, but at the same time they are very different. And Christians are praying, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Galileo and Newton made this prayer stupid. They said, well, everything is according to his will. And they have proven in their own eyes that earth moves and so Bible cannot be understood in the best case scenario or it is lying in the worst case scenario. But they haven't stopped there. They have said that time is absolute. And people thought that Bible teaches that, but it doesn't. Bible speaks about relativity of time. And then Einstein came and has proven that time is relative. And so in the eyes of people, once again, the Bible was proven wrong, when in reality, Newton and Galileo were proven wrong. And so in the eyes of people, Galileo, Newton and Einstein were right, but the Bible wrong. How honest is that? The main objective was to eliminate God completely out of the equations and our lives. So, it is not that everything is relative, that there is no absolute observer. There is the absolute observer and he is God, and his laws are absolute. Our imaginary approximations of his laws are relative. People liked Einstein because they liked the phrase that everything is relative. You might harm others, and is that bad? Well, that's relative. It is relative to you, but you will be judged by absolute standard. And where did lie of Einstein lead science? Well, the latest measurements of movements of celestial bodies are showing that the universe is expanding, and not only that, it is accelerating. How is that possible? No one knows. It contradicts the foundations of physics. The lie has come to its end. The things don't make sense anymore. Ordinary people are baffled from the time of Galileo on, but now even scientists. That is the end result of glorious evolution of science. Everything collapsed. If a witness in the court is lying, and if it is lying long enough, it contradicts himself and his testimony doesn't make any sense anymore. And that happened with the testimony of science. At first scientific equations, approximations of laws didn't make sense when observing galaxies. So they came up with the concept of black holes, which they didn't see, but in order that their equations remained valid, black holes had to be in the middle of many galaxies and also at another locations. And now concept of dark matter and dark energy is being introduced. No one can see dark matter nor dark energy and no one knows what they are, but in order that the equations and human-made approximations of the real laws remain valid, absolute truth, they have to be there somewhere. Scientists were claiming that they see, but now it is estimated that more than 95.1% of total mass and energy is dark matter and dark energy. So science, who wanted to explain things and who was claiming that she sees, she sees nothing. All those theories fell apart. Everything now is fitting the parameters. Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton, Einstein didn't want only to describe things, movements of planets, stars. 
That's why they came up with speculation about the nature of forces and equations. But those speculations, equations, fell apart miserably and what scientists are doing now is the same as people were doing before Galileo Galilei. They are watching stars and they are baffled. Scientific blind guesses, equations, theories are many times self-fulfilling prophecies because they have many parameters and one only fit parameters. An illusion of the correctness of one particular theory is born or at least strengthened. But now everything fell apart. When I was studying physics, a professor told us how science physics is evolving. There was a time when we weren't able to solve problem of two particles in the otherwise completely empty universe. Forget stars, planets, people. Only two particles and nothing else. Then we were able to write down equations for such a problem. Let's say for gravity and then for a hydrogen atom, centuries later. And then we were not able to solve a problem if the whole universe would be empty and there would be only one particle in it. Why not? Because electron is considered to be sometimes a wave and sometimes a particle. And then when they figured that out, scientists had a problem to describe empty universe with no particles at all. Why? Because now particles, without a cause or reason, emerge from nothingness and then they return to nothingness according to today's science. Such was the progress evolution of science. Better name for evolution of science would be evolution or devolution or devolution. When I heard the truth from the mouth of a scientist, I was shocked. To people we are saying something completely else. We are deceiving people. And I was deceived too. If I would know that truth, I would never ever study physics. Science rejected geocentrism because they claimed that they want to know the reason, cause, why stars move in the way they move. They imagined such theories, virtual realities, that the movements of stars as they move in geocentrical model didn't make sense to them. It was not reasonable. Why not? Because they imagined such theories. They could imagine different kinds of theories and everything would make the same sense, but the Earth would be at the center of the universe. But as the science evolved, it accepted that mass can change without a cause, without a reason, and that was fine. They accepted that electron is sometimes particle and sometimes a wave. This was not reasonable for scientists at that time, but they have accepted that nevertheless. They have accepted the idea that length contracts, that time shrinks, that perturbation of light travels in nothingness. Those things didn't make sense to scientists. There is no reason behind it. Their only explanation is, this is so because it is so. And the list goes on and on and on. Science had accepted all the nonsense and by doing so it contradicted itself. It lied and it lies. And its lies are many. The main point was that the Bible was wrong. The movement at that time was absolute. And when this idea was accepted by almost everyone, Einstein came and said, you know what, it doesn't matter who moves, movement is relative. Let's say that I would claim that your money is my money and I would make up various so-called proofs and grab your money. And then when my testimony would not make sense anymore because I would lie, I would say, well, it doesn't really matter whose money it is. It is mine, but it could be yours too. Can't we be just friends? You would say, and rightly so, that I am a deceiver and no good person. And why then are you not judging with the same judgment science too? Let's read the Bible now. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Things, equations, work here on the earth, but when applying them on the universe, they don't work. That's it. Because there is some difference between the earth and the universe. Forces, speeds, laws are not completely the same. And that could mean that the universe is moving around the earth nevertheless. And it could easily be that the universe and the sun are not as big, as huge as it is claimed 
by blind scientists. I was shocked when watching stars from a relatively huge telescope. It has its own house, it is not small. An astronomer said to us that stars are just stars, dots. Because of this and that reason we see them as blurred dots, but no matter how big telescopes we use, they always remain dots. Proponents of science are using their imagination when they make pictures and movies about stars, which are presented in a similar way as our sun is, and imaginary planets are orbiting those stars. No one saw anything like that. It is a complete imagination, speculation, a lie. I was there with students of mathematics and I guess there were also students of astronomy. And we measured the, apparently, distance of one galaxy from the Earth. That was a huge disappointment for me. We had to assume so many things which very easily might not be true. And the same proponents of science are telling us how life could evolve also on another planets or planetary systems. Yes, we can imagine, and that's all. Scientist makes observation, and then he gives an estimation. If scientists don't know how the life began, they cannot make any estimation how rare life is in their imaginary universe. From our observation and simple maths, we can find out that it is impossible that life began on its own, by chance, because that chance is so, so, so small. But nevertheless, some proponents of science dare to make videos of imaginary planets telling children and others how life began also there. How? They don't know, but they can imagine. This is not scientific, because they didn't make any estimation, and if you don't make estimation, you have to be quiet but they aren't, and everyone agrees with those guys and women. Why? Because it works. People believe science, people trust science, it captures their time, imagination, thoughts, hopes. But it is only a speculation at best, and a lying lie at worst. And the second option is very likely to be more true than the first one. And all those newly discovered planets for which scientists claim to know even their composition, well, that is stupid. Did they see any such planet? No. Even stars are only dots. So how could they see a planet? Only through the lenses of their theories, equations, for which we know that they are not reliable. But that doesn't prevent them to tell the whole world what they have discovered. They can tell the mass and composition of a planet which is many light years away from us. But what is the composition of a particular celestial body, which is, according to them, only a couple of light minutes away, they cannot tell, if they don't send a space sonde there. All those measurements rely heavily on speculations and on heavy assumptions. What are they worth? Not much. It is, I guess, two years now since I listened to a couple of people explaining about Michelson and geocentrism. If I would be still a believer in science, I would not listen to them, and if I would not know anything about science, I would not listen to them either. But I did listen to them and thought about it. And it was so nice to realize that I'm standing on a firm, solid, not moving ground. The ground was slipping under my feet since the time the lie about the rotating Earth was told to me. And I looked at heavens and all the universe was rotating around the Earth. It was beautiful. That reminded me how I looked at the world as a child. I was robbed of so much by lying and deceiving physicists. We were all robbed. There is a lie practically everywhere, but the Bible, the more you look in it, the more truth you will find there. Praise be the Lord. The next time, if God willing, I will show you how scientific so-called knowledge differs from the biblical one and how the end result of scientific knowledge was already foretold in the Bible. That end result is something which all those scientists over the centuries began to realize but are still refusing to accept. They know, but they are lying to themselves. But Bible, as the superior authority, makes that clear. And you will see, hopefully, 
how the testimony of the Bible is reasonable from the beginning to the end. It is a completely different testimony than testimony of sciences. Be well and let the Lord bless you, that you might see, not the universe, the matter as dark, hopeless, but as light and full of hope, not being fooled by lying hope, but trusting the real hope, the truth, and so that your life could be changed from being heavy to being light. In Jesus' name do I pray, and if you agree, you may say Amen. So be it.